My name is Derek Gardner. I am from Chicago, Illinois. I am a, a jazz musician, jazz trumpeter, composer, arranger, educator. And this is the premiere recording of the Big Dig Band. This project that we're doing here today um, this is a significant project for us in Manitoba. We've never had anybody pl that plays like, like him uh, in Manitoba. Uh, we've never had anybody who's played with the people that he's played with in Manitoba. Derek is my older brother, and so, um, you know, he was, of course, playing long before I was. He was playing trumpet, you know, when I came, by the time I came along. And um, we come from a musical family, so uh, both of our parents are music educators, both taught at colleges while we were growing up. Our father's a trumpet player, our mother is a uh, pianist, a choir director. And so um, we, uh, we always had instruments in our hands or always around the piano and we had a closet in our house that had every instrument in it, you know, our parents being music educators. So we had access to, to music and were around concerts at different universities, choir concerts, jazz band concerts, co um, university uh, orchestra concerts, anything. We were just always around music. So um, you know, I started playing violin at five, piano at six, trombone at 13 and a bunch of different stuff in between that and, and um, you know, we just were always around it. My father, uh, he had his practice room down in the basement of our house and um, he was always doing, you know, doing some, some slick stuff on the trumpet, you know, practicing improvisation and he was always composing and arranging. There was one day when I was in school, I was in the fifth grade. They started an elementary school band program and the director of the band said, uh, who wants to join the band? You know, so I was like, oh, I want to join, you know? And um, he said, okay, what do you want to play? He said, I want to play the trumpet. And he said, oh, well, I don't think we have a trumpet. I said, I'll get one. You know? <laughs> so I went to, uh, I ran home. I was like, dad, I want to play the trumpet. He's like, really? Okay, well, all right, well, I'll, I'll get you a trumpet. So he uh, got me a trumpet. And um, the rest is history. I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, in a you know, metropolitan area. Went to college in uh, Hampton, Virginia, and that's actually where I met Derek. And I met Derek's uh, mom. She was like in the department, the music department. And, um, uh, and I was just blown away by the way Derek sounded then. You know, he was a few years older than me, but I was just, like looked up to him and I was like, man, I, I just want to be in that cat's band. And then, um, about my sophomore year, he, he, uh, he had started grad school and he said, you have to come to Indiana University. So I said, okay, I auditioned, I got into grad school at Indiana University. And he was going out on the road with a basic band. And so I finished at IU and then he says, then you gotta come to New York. So then I went to New York and uh, I lived with uh, Derek and Vincent at the time. And Vincent was playing with uh, Marcus Roberts and starting to do the Lincoln Center thing and Derek was on the road. He and his brother, they worked before they started doing their own projects and other great things. Um, we were all kind of coming up together in New York City. This is probably, again, um, early 90s. Um, and we were all living in Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York, which was kind of this mecca, this bohemian mecca for, for just art and culture. Um, it was nothing to see um, you know, you go to a, a local diner there, you see Spike Lee sitting at a coffee table talking to Wesley Snipes about an upcoming project, this movie called Do the Right Thing, right? Um, or you see Denzel Washington there, or you walk along the street and you see Chris Rock walking down the street, taking the subway into town, doing this little show called Saturday Night Live. Um, or you see a whole host of other musicians, uh, Terrence Blanchard, Bradford Marcellus, Kenny Kirkland, Jeff Watts, and, and little old us, you know, we kind of looked, they were kind of a school before us, so we kind of looked to them as mentors and as inspiration for what we did. Um, so being in that nucleus of these up, up, uh, young artists such as myself and, and Derek and, and his brother Vincent, we kind of formed a bond together. We would go to jam sessions together in Brooklyn and kind of work on our craft, you know, that being learning jazz standard repertoire, 
as well as improvisation. Um, so again, going back to the 90s, I've known Derek for a long time, um, in and out of bands, different bands. Um, you know, he was doing sort of the Count Basie Orchestra at the same time that I was doing the Duke Ellington Orchestra. So we would kind of cross paths, you know, at different festivals and, and that kind of thing. I spent Oh, good, 11 or 12 years in New York City. That is the greatest music scene. Not just, I was about to say that's the greatest jazz scene, but it's the greatest music scene, in my opinion, in the world. Um, because uh, it's, it's true that, uh, you know, what Frank Sinatra said, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere, you know? When we first moved to New York, there's this famous trumpet player, Roy Hargrove, and who, who just recently passed, but we would play at this jam session in um, a place called the St. Mark's Bar, and one night, Derek gets up to play a solo, and then Roy jumps in and plays the chorus, like he's challenging, like it's a battle. Roy he was very competitive, and uh, so they go back and forth, and then Roy starts to try to play really high. He's, you know, starts playing high, he's like, okay, he gets up to around D, and then E flat, and Derek's just like laying in a cut, and then Roy's like, the next chorus, tries to play like F, which is pretty high on the trumpet. And then Derek, on the next chorus, he plays a fourth above the highest note that uh, Roy played, and it was like super loud and super strong. The whole crowd, the whole bar just was like, oh! The Roy's jumping up and down like, ah! It was hilarious, it was, you know, it was like, cause Roy initiated this competition and Derek was like, okay, I'm just gonna blow him out the water with just one note. And that was like the remarkable uh, moment of all those jam sessions that I can remember. That was probably like my most favorite moment. Is this thing live? Yeah. All right, let me tell you, let me tell y'all the real backstop, backdrop about Derek Gardner. He and I, we got a long history together. He's a fraternity man. I'm a fraternity man. But he's, he's a kappa. You don't want to be Kappa Alpha Psi, you want to be Alpha Phi Alpha, you know. We started the whole thing, 1906. I'll give y'all a little preview of what we used to do. Hey, boy! <laughs> and that's all y'all get, that's all you get. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> See, what I tell y'all? Get back. What you think, what you think? There are many arrangers that I pattern myself after, you know, one being my, my dad, um, he's an incredible uh, composer, arranger, and just growing up with his music in my ear great, has greatly affected the way that I put together my music, you know, and he gave me some of my first uh, arranging lessons. You know that I, that I still you know um, embrace today, and and I'm very much influenced by uh, Frank Foster, who was the uh, uh, one of the chief arrangers of the Count Basie Orchestra uh, in the 50s and 60s, and then came back to lead the orchestra in the, in the uh, 80s and 90s, and um, he recruited me into the Basie band in the early 90s when I was about I was about 24 or 25. And, um, and I was in, in grad school at the time, and I got the opportunity to, to go out with the Count Basie Orchestra. Uh, so I left school, I said, I'm gone, you know, I got this opportunity, I gotta take it, you know. And um, then I saw all the stuff that Frank Foster was doing, you know, all his writing and everything, and I wanted to get a piece of that. We're going from city to city on the bus. We played the gig, and then we'd get up the next morning, we'd get on the bus and we'd travel, you know you know, six, seven hundred miles to the next city. And so Frank is uh, sitting up in, in the front of the bus and my seat is uh, toward the back, you know. And um, he has a score paper with a black felt tip pen. He has no piano. You know, he's doing, everything is up here. So he's going saxophones, dee da dee da dee da da. Trombones, dee da dee da da. Trumpets, dee da dee da da. And he's, and he's writing down like this, you know. And, um, so I'm looking at that and I'm like, wow, that's amazing. And so, and with no piano, and I said, you know, maybe I can do that, you know. So I, you know, next city we got to, I got me a pad of score paper, you know, and a pencil. Cause I make, I knew I was gonna make some mistakes. So I got my pencil, I was like, out, uh, saxophones, dee da, dee da, trombone, dee da, trumpets, dee da. So I write my stuff down, you know. And about a couple weeks later, I had about, you know, maybe a page or so of, of an arrangement. 
And on one of our trips, I went up to Foss and said, hey, Foss, man, could you check me out, man, and see if I'm kind of on the right track? And he said, okay, let me see what you got. So he looked at it, and he had his black pen he was looking at it, so all right. And so, while well, he's looking at it, he takes the cap and puts it on, on the pen, and he reaches over the other side of the pocket and grabs his red pen and takes the cap off. And he said, okay, now why do you have this right there? This is wrong, you know, you shouldn't do that. And that's an A flat, it should be A natural. You got the third going against the, that. That's, that's, so you gotta redo that. And this whole line underneath the, underneath the lead line, that's too far down, you gotta do this and that. So he read that, and he's just doing this the whole time to my score, just, you know, and it just bled all over my score, basically, you know. And he said, okay, here, take this and work on it. And I'm looking at my score like, what happened? <laughs> Oh, I go back to the back of the bus like, oh no, you know. And um, when I got back, and when I got to the, um, um, the the next venue we played at, I went to the piano and started kind of working out the stuff that he, he was talking about. I said, oh, oh, I see. And so then, maybe a couple weeks later, I made the corrections and had a few more measures done. And I went, went up to to the front of the bus again to Foss and said, would you kind of look at you know look at my stuff and. Uh, Again, he grabbed his red, her red pen, you know, he said, okay, that's all right, okay, that's cool. Um, it leads over to that, and that, but this here, no, you can't do that again, that's, you shouldn't do that. And this was, so he started doing the thing, you know, and it wasn't as much blood on my page as before, you know, and so I said, okay, well, I made some accomplishments. I went back to, back, got to the piano again, did the, you know, then, you know, a couple weeks later, check it out, and I had less, and less red marks on my thing, you know, each time I went. So that was extremely uh, educational for me, you know, and I, and I continued to, to study with him up until he passed away in uh, 2011. And uh, um, so that's how I became to, you know, be the arranger that I am today. Big Dig Band was started by myself and a phenomenal bassist by the name of Steve Kirby. And the concept of the band was to make it a composer's jam session. We wanted to focus on original music, you know, and so we opened up our concerts to composers that wanted to have their, their music featured and workshopped in front of a live audience. It was more of a reading band. And uh, so we, we, we chewed on a lot of different material, once a month kind of thing, um, which, was, which was interesting. It was a new experience for everybody to actually do that in front of an audience. We would just get up on stage and um, yeah, read through, read through charts and kind of give the audience the uh, behind the scenes look of how a big band learns to play music. We decided to go with that concept, you know, because uh, um, it hadn't been done here in Winnipeg. And we wanted to make ourselves, uh, we wanted to distinguish ourselves as being different than the other uh, big bands that were around the area. That was sort of uh, our, our first foray into some of Derek's writing, um, which is quite different than, than the writing that we're, we're used to playing, or certainly uh, the stuff that you, you know, can buy from the, from the stores. When I got the opportunity to record my music, I said, you know, we gotta record the band, you know, and just keep this thing alive. Myself, Rob, and Vincent, we are the horn section for my small group, my sextet, known as the, the Jazz Prophets, and we've recorded uh, three uh, recordings in previous years and uh, so I had to have the the Jazz Prophet horns you know as part of this thing. We've done a number of recordings with the Jazz Prophets and a lot of these are big band versions of the Jazz Prophet sextet small six piece you know band um, um, pieces and um, to, to hear him expand them now into this big band format is wonderful because I've, some of these I've never, I haven't played before, the big band charts, I've never played them, a lot of them. And um, remembering what they were like when we first did them and I seeing him expand them into a full big band, uh, a big band recording. And then also 
having that vehicle of the Big Dig Band to workshop and work through those things in, in public is, is a great it's, it's a great setting because people don't get to see kind of the inner workings of what happens in the jazz band. What's so interesting is he's got people from all different walks and, and stages of life playing in that room and then somehow it just sounds so cohesive. Uh, people that just got years of experience playing with like very, very notable bands and to people that are still in school and somehow they've all been handpicked by Derek and he's got a master plan. The nucleus is New York, but he's got guys coming in from California, from Texas, from New York, from, from Illinois, from Florida. You know, we're coming in from all these different places and pairing ourselves with the musicians who are here, the seasoned Canadian musicians, as well as the younger musicians, with one mission in mind. You know, music, Art Blakey used to often say, you know, music is the common language of, of, of all of humanity. I appreciate that Derek uh, is pulling people from all different kind of um, parts of his life and giving younger people an opportunity to jump in with more experienced people. It's great to get an opportunity to work with um, guys like Mark Gross and then um, B. John Watson and uh, Vincent Gardner, who I've known um, just kind of like we've crossed paths um, you know, as performers and professionals, but also going back to my time as a student of Derek's, you know, those guys were obviously professionals and all on the scene then. So it's very nice to kind of break musical bread with those guys now as like a professional on the level. I can't believe the amount of talent that we have in this group and us as students is just like a great opportunity to work with some of the greats like Mark and Rob in my section for example. Um, it's really enlightening to just hear, you know, some of the masters play and try to play into their sound. So I definitely love having this experience to work with Derek and the rest of the band. I've been playing in the big band for the past four years, like at the university, so it's literally a dream come true. You just get so much better. It's pretty crazy. It feels like I'm wildly out of place. <laughs> but uh, I've got Tristan and Anthony here who are my classmates, same year. Uh, so I can kind of be like, okay, like I'm not the only one who's having this experience. You learn the most by sitting next to those who have gone through the process and, and played with other great players. The young man who's playing guitar in this band is uh, a student of mine and uh, was a, a high school player uh, at the school I taught. And uh, so to have Casey, um, on this record and to look over and see that young man and know that we've spent some time together and uh, and then Derek has spent some time with him at the university level is a really big deal to me. Part of being a jazz musician and building the jazz community is, is sitting next to other musicians that want to understand what it is to perform at that level. It's really an incredible thing, but it's if, if you just go back, you'd see that Art Blakey always was hiring young players, and Herbie Hancock is always working with young musicians, and Wayne Shorter is always working with, and Miles was always hiring young players. So there, there really is something about how the music gets transmitted from one generation to the next that it's really not segregated. I think it's a great thing, and I wouldn't be remotely surprised if Derek has it by design that this is really part of how the music, how it moves and how it lives through time. I think it's fabulous. We're all really here together and that's a, one of the greatest things about jazz music is that you know when, you, when, when people are aligned in doing it you find a way to come together on one accord and just play, make, make good music. So it works well because everybody understands that. And um, as long as we're, you know, no, there, there, are no, there are no egos in the room, and of course there shouldn't be. But I mean, everybody's cool, everybody loves the music, and everybody loves Derek. And so, so we're all here, you know, for him to make sure to, to try to bring his vision alive. When we did the, um, the kind of demo for the, the funding to try and get some funding for it, um, you know, you do a lot of those, and um, a lot of the time, because there's there's competition for the funding, so you never know if it's actually going to turn into something. Um, so it was kind of fingers crossed for this one because it's such a such a great opportunity to um, sit in a band full of so many great players and play music that's been just written for that band. Um, that that type of thing doesn't happen a lot anymore, 
Um, so uh, when he sent out the email saying, I got the funding and we're going to record a whole CD, it was, was kind of like, yes, oh, this is going to be a lot of work, but yes. Every time I know I'm doing a Derek Gardner session or recording or music, I know the music is going to be just beyond my grasp, you know, like just to play it because I know it's going to be super hard. So I always try to prepare and it seems like no matter how much you prepare, you can't prepare enough for his music because it's like you're thinking like, okay, I got this. And he goes, well, that actually the tempo is like four times as fast as you're playing. And you're like, oh, okay, well, I don't know if this is going to work out. But eventually it does. He's, you know, we're able to pull it together in each situation that I've worked with him in. And it's great because it really just pushes all the musicians. Uh, it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it's demanding, yeah. It's uh, not uh, uh, run of the mill uh, playing that you, you know, the arrangements are, are, are technically demanding, so you have to do some preparation and, uh, you know, just slog away at it so that you're somewhat prepared for, you know, when you get to uh, get to this rehearsal process so you can, uh, you can hold your own uh, or try. <laughs> you get the email with the Dropbox invitation and my life, it didn't really allow me to look in the Dropbox folder until somewhere around December 20th or something. And then I thought, okay, I'll print. I'll print the music and tape the parts and, start, and look to see what looks like it's going to be hard. So, you just, so I, I basically had whatever over the holidays to sort of troubleshoot and figure out what do I need to run. And then my practice was get up in the morning, make some coffee, get into the practice room, because I also had to get my, my endurance up so that I could make it through these long days of, of playing a lot and playing loud. And so I just would do a little bit more every day and then start to identify like the gap between my capacity and what was going to be <laughs> expected when I showed up on New Year's Day. It's uh, a lot of music and it was very challenging. There's a lot of moving pieces, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of things to put together. So, you know, it's good that we've got, you know, quite a bit of rehearsal time. It jumps around a lot and um, I'm playing one of the lower parts so it's a lot of inner voices um, so it doesn't necessarily have a melodic sense a lot of the time so um, there's that which is just jumping around range wise um, which is a little bit tricky and uh, rhythmically you know you're usually sticking with your section but people around you are not necessarily doing the same thing as you so it's a little bit tricky to kind of just lay down what you've got when everyone else around you is doing something different but um, it, once it fits it, it's like okay that's how it should go and it fits really nicely but it's just getting to that point where everyone's on the same page. I'm just growing such an appreciation for the amount of detail that has been put into each chart in terms of you know the voicings for the rhythm section um, and oh my god I'm so glad I don't play saxophone for this one he's really really the saxophone players are earning their money on this one I think he wrote something like six songs for this recording that have some really challenging saxophone soli parts and uh, I remember seeing them the first time when we did our uh, it was kind of like a draft recording it was like mind-boggling, like I'm like, how could you do this to us, Derek? <laughs> like, this is really hard for us to play. And uh, seeing them again, it's like, yep, yep, those are difficult. And for some reason he hates saxophones, I guess. <laughs> like, come on, why you do this to us, Derek? But uh, it, it's only made me such a better player to work on those kind of things. Something that Derek can do that is that's very special and unique to him is that he can, you know, he pushes his students to the limits. I feel like that he does that with professional musicians. He's worked with like some of the most well-known and renowned jazz musicians in the world. And if you get on his band, he's gonna push you to the limit because his music actually calls for that. You no, know, Derek writes hard music, you know, and he does. And everybody uh, understands that going in. It's hard, but it's grooving, and that's the thing about it. But as a musician, it's challenging to play, and so getting into it. Uh, you know, your eyes cross a little bit when you see some of the rhythms going this way and that way, you know, until you, until you actually just stop trying to overanalyze it and feel what it is and put what you're feeling along with what you're reading, then it all makes sense. I mean, this is definitely a session that I don't think anybody just came in cold to. Um, everybody got the music in advance and, and looked at it and um, uh, there's, everyone has some, some parts at some point that, that you really have to spend some time in the woodshed by yourself. Um,
but uh, but people people obviously have, and so that just makes the whole uh, the whole experience more um, more satisfying when Derek counts off the band and it just it sounds great right away, and then as we rehearse, it sounds better and better. I came up to him, I think maybe after the first take of one of the tunes we did today in this in the session, and I said to him, I thanked him because it was, you know, I'm always. I always have a sense of appreciation for all the opportunities that I have in my life because there's just so many great musicians out there and so it's very competitive but the reality is that when you have an opportunity to really like you know play some really high level music yeah it's challenging but it's it's a fun challenging because it's uh, you know you're enjoying what you're doing and you really want to do service to the music. Whenever you have an opportunity to do original music and original writing and original arrangements it's a challenge you want to challenge yourself and especially with a player of, of Derek's talent, the way he thinks musically, uh, it's, it's exciting to see that transferred to a large ensemble. Of course, I've heard a lot of the things that he's played in the small group, so to hear it transferred to a large ensemble and actually think like him as a player, it's, it's a challenge, but it's fun to see the end result and all the thing, inner workings that's going on creatively and going on in his head to put it on the paper and, and to hear that and that energy that's created is awesome. When you're sitting at home practicing it by yourself, you have no point of context. But when it comes together, you're like, oh, I see why he wrote this, even though it's flipping ridiculously challenging. <laughs> Um, it's still, uh, there's a reward at the end of it when we all come together and, and perform it well, so. I've written all original music. The first piece that comes to mind is a, uh, a tune I wrote called Melody for Trayvon. And it's about Trayvon Martin, who was an African-American teenager. He was 17 years old and he was fatally shot. You know, he was uh, walking home from a convenience store to his uh, parents' house, and his parents' house was in a neighborhood that one of the other residents didn't think that he belonged. So this resident, he uh, challenged this, this kid, and uh, Trayvon had every right to, to be there. He was just going back home to his parents' house, and the, and the guy shot him. And so this is really no different than a lot of the, the violence uh, toward African Americans that has been going on in America for the last you know, 400 years. But this particular case sparked a new era of, of gun violence toward African Americans in the States. And um, there was a huge rallying call to stop gun violence and to make gun violence a thing that shouldn't be happening anymore. And so this a uh, piece of music is dedicated to him and his family, and um, and afterwards, after it's all released and everything, I'm definitely going to send uh, the uh, uh, Trayvon Martin's family, you know, uh, a copy of this CD, and you know they can do whatever they want to with that song, you know, because it's their song. Another tune uh, called "Soulful Brother Gillespie," written for uh, a great drummer named Randy Gillespie. Uh, people will look at it and say, oh, that must be uh, related to Dizzy Gillespie because Derek's a trumpet player. I said, no, this is Randy Gillespie. And Randy is an unsung hero of the drums. A lot of people don't really know about him, um, but he was uh, on the uh, scene back in the uh, 50s and 60s, and, uh, and he played with people like uh, Wes Montgomery, uh, he was his drummer for a long time, and Sonny Stitt, and uh, a whole laundry list of other, other people, you know. And um, we were playing together one day, and we were going through, there's a thing, a sequence that, and, that we do in, in uh, jazz called trading four, or trading eights, where I'll play for eight measures, and then, you'll, then the drums will play for a solo for eight measures, then the saxophone will play for eight measures, then drums, you know, then piano, drums like that, you know. And uh, so I played something, my eight measures, then all of a sudden, Randy Gillespie played this, this groove. You know, I was like, whoa, that was so incredible. It was just as, as significant as um, Ahmad Jamal's 
big hit back in the 50s called Poinciana. And the, that drum groove was copied by thousands of drummers over the years. And um, this groove that Randy laid down affected me so much that I had to write something around it. So I wrote a whole composition around it and then I expanded it for um, uh, a big band arrangement. Another piece that, that kind of comes to mind is a piece I wrote dedicated to the great poet Maya Angelou. Uh, and she wrote one of my favorite poems called Still I Rise. It's a poem that tells the, uh, the plight of, of, of African Americans over the last 400 years, you know, uh, through the condition of slavery, through uh, emancipation, through uh, 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 Reconstruction, through uh, Jim Crow, through civil rights, you know, everything. The poem just kind of tells it all, you know. She has an incredible body of work, and when she passed away, uh, I said, man, I was, you know, it, it was just a, such a huge loss to the world of creative people. Uh, I just had to write something for her, and so I included that tune on this project. Another song is one that I wrote for my father called uh, Blues a la Burgess, and he's an incredible trumpeter, uh, composer, arranger, and so much to, in order to describe this, I always say, you know, when my father pulls out his horn, I put my horn in the case. I don't even try to compete with him on the horn because he's such a phenomenal uh, soloist. And being of, the, of a younger generation of musicians, of, particularly of jazz musicians, you know, I, I think I got some stuff together. You know, I can, I can play some stuff. I ain't, I ain't no slouch, you know. Um, but, you know, people of that older generation have stuff that they, they've been playing for the last 50 years, you know. I've never heard anybody interweave the blues into the DNA of the arrangement like my father has done. His arrangements are so, uh, so soulful. And that's like the real, uh, the real guts of the music. That's what really grabs the listener. I heard my uh, my father uh, play something on this recording that he that he did, and uh, when he was he was soloing, and and it it immediately grabbed me, and I said, you know, I, I'm I'm going to extract that. I'm going to do something with that little musical idea that he played. And, um, and I put it into a blues and I named it Blues Isle of Burgess, you know, dedicated to my dad. I think the listener can look forward to a really solid record of Derek's language and music and his ideas and concepts developed over his career. He has such a wide variety of charts that he's written through his lifetime. He's got a really great mix of stuff on this one. He's got something for everybody. You know, your diehard swing fans, you know, your medium tempo, like in there, nice bounce. He's got some of that in there. He's got some up tempo, edgy, you know, on the vibe, pushing you forward type stuff. Um, he's got some very pretty, slow, melodic, ballad, lush type of arrangements. Um, he's got everything in there. Your each tune features kind of a different section of the band, so there's um, a lot of variety in that sense too. It's not always just saxophone heavy, which there is a lot of saxophone, but you know every, every instrument or every section gets their, their kind of spotlight, so to speak. Very swinging, very uh, dynamic record. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be a very exciting record by the time it's done. You know, the, uh, it's, a, it's a whole journey. <laughs> He has a very clear understanding of the past and the history of the music. And he also has a, 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 a bead on where it's going. And, uh, and you can hear that in his, in his other groups of jazz prophets and whatnot. So I think he's brought some of that, those ideas and, um, into this writing for, for, for Big Band. It's massively written music with, with depth and feeling. And, um, and supreme imagination, you know, from Derek Gardner. He just has, has put together, um, as he always does, he's just put together a, a collection of original, original pieces, compositions, and arrangements that, uh, that showcase the best of what, what the big band has to offer, um, steeped in tradition, but, but not mimicking, you know, not, on, not solely mimicking the, the bands of the past. He has a lot of things in here that are solely him, that are reflective of him in 2019 
and things that I didn't, I don't remember him, you know, writing in 2012 or 2010. So it's very up to date as far as what he has to offer in jazz music. And, and so uh, it's, it's a very current document, very current recording that we're doing. And I think that's what you're going to hear. It's very genuine and it's going to make you feel good. You're going to hear things that has influenced him as a, as a writer and as a player. Um, and you're going to hear some really modern elements in music. Modern meaning that he's really, for big band, big bands, particularly during the swing era, were, were traditionally known to play dance music, which is great. Uh, dance music meaning music that's just kind of, you know, we call it the business band, businessman's bounce, so Derek, that's what he calls it. Just kind of medium tempo, just easy going, you know. And he's found a way to still have that in the music, but you can still feel through his compositional writing the urgency of him trying to get across another message. So the listener is going to be engaged in, in that kind of style of music, the businessman's bounce, and the compositional edginess of, of how he's orchestrated this band. And by that I mean it's he's allowed the, the, the orchestration to, to lead to platforms for the soloists, the great soloists in the band, to really explore and to, to evoke their own voice inside of his, his music um, without kind of handcuffing and restricting you to a certain thing. Um, you're gonna hear um, beautiful melodies. You're gonna hear really uh, sophisticated interplay between the sections in the orchestra, you know, between the saxophones, the trombones, the trumpet, of course, in the, the rhythm section, um, but done all in a really, really hip kind of way. I think it's going to be a high level of musicianship on this record. It's traditional sounding jazz written with um, a really inventive, creative mindset. You know, you can hear elements of Frank Foster and um, Thad Jones, you can hear elements of those folks in Derek's writing, but it doesn't, it's not an imitation. Um, it's, it's his own, it's very unique sounding. Get ready for some really amazing heavy swing in music that's going to really, I think, most importantly touch people's hearts, you know, because it's, it's a, it's very, like all the writing is very sincere, I think, and it's coming from the heart first. Derek has done a great job. I mean, it's a, it's a great piece and he always, he always puts, he always puts his heart out there for the, for the music. You know, he always puts it right on the, there's, just, there's no covering up anything. This is who he is, and this is how he writes, and, and, and as, as warm as he is as a person, that's the way the music's gonna make you feel. So it's just important to, to just go into it, just, just listen to it and let it make you feel how it makes you feel. The, the level of energy that this band produces will be transferred. You know, a lot of times you listen to some albums, it's kinda like, eh, you know, that's cool, but you don't feel engaged. I think the music that Derek writes will instantly engage you to want to listen to more. And a lot of times some people write things that are so complex and difficult, I call it musicus profundus. It's just like written to be difficult for difficulty's sake. But that's not what this is about. It, it, it makes sense musically. So even to the maybe not uh, um, the educated jazz listener or whatever, they can still, it's accessible to them because it still makes sense, even as complex as it is. And even for the, you know, the jazz nerds, uh, it's still gonna, you know, really get them excited too. It's like, wow, this is amazing. How are people able to play this? So uh, hopefully that'll be transferred. I said, you definitely need to check this record out when it comes out because the music is brilliant. It is genius and it's like modern big band writing and it's very personal to Derek because his spirit and his personality and all that comes out in the music. Like his sound, like the way he plays, the way he improvises, he, he put that all in the writing. So he put like everything into this. So I think you, whoever is out there lis listening or seeing this, look for the music, find it, buy it, do whatever you need to do to get your hands on it. It's, it's amazing. I hope that I've put out a quality product for you and I invite you to, to come and have a listen and enjoy some music. It's going to be killing. It's going to be killing. Ha ha ha.